My name is Kim Chapman, and I'm the nurse manager here at Wentworth Douglas Hospital Center for Heart Health. I'm excited to welcome you to our fifth annual Women's Heart Health event. This is the second year we've done a virtual webinar, and while I miss our in-person event, I'm grateful that you're all here tonight. Uh, so as many of you know, the month of February is known as Heart Month, and we host these events so that you can learn about cardiac disease in women, how it can present differently than in men, what the risk factors are, and about lifestyle changes that can help prevent and treat heart disease. We used your feedback from previous years, and this year we're focusing on different diagnostic tests that are used to diagnose and monitor heart disease. So I'm thrilled to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Whitney Coppolino. Dr. Coppolino is board certified in cardiology and internal medicine. She earned her medical degree from the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California. She completed her residency at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia. She is fellowship trained in both cardiovascular disease at Hofstra Northwell Long Island Jewish Health System and women's heart health from the Massachusetts General Hospital. She specializes in non-invasive cardiology, echocardiography, and women's heart health. Dr. Coppolino sees patients at our Pease location in Portsmouth. Uh, she's truly one of the most down-to-earth and kind providers I know. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Whitney Coppolino. Thank you so much, Kim. And I want to just give a special shout out to Kim because she is amazing with the PowerPoint and helping me put this all thing together. We wouldn't be here without Kim and Linda. So thank you both. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, just um, paperwork wise, no disclosures, no financial conflicts to um, disclose. So today for our talk, what we thought would be um, interesting for everyone is to kind of give a, an overview background of why women's heart health is so important and the history of it over the years. And then to kind of go walk everybody through the different kinds of cardiac testing, what they are um, and who needs them and why and that sort of thing. Um, so we're gonna talk about EKGs, all sorts of monitors, mainly the ZO patch, which is the best one now, uh, what an echocardiogram is, all the various forms of stress testing. Uh, we'll discuss uh, coronary artery calcium scoring, um, and then coronary CT angiogram, cardiac catheterization, cardiac MRI. And then at the end, we're going to have questions and answers, and Kim's going to help me field uh, whatever questions you guys have. <clears throat> so just as a little overview and background, um, it's important for us to realize as a society that heart disease kills more women than all cancers combined. Um, I think, you know, in over the years, breast cancer has gotten a lot of press and a lot of attention, and that's wonderful. But we, we lost a little bit of sight of our actual number one killer of women, which is heart disease. Um, so little bit of background in um, women's heart health as it is uh, sort of a niche in cardiology. Um, historically, cardiology was a predominantly male profession um, and a lot of cardiology is based, the reason I joined cardiology was because it's based in, in fact, in literature, in evidence and science. It's, it's been, everything we do has been meticulously studied and, and guidelines and recommendations have been made based on those studies. It became obvious kind of in the, probably in the late eighties and the nineties that women were grossly underrepresented, not only in the field as physicians, but in the studies that we're basing everything on. Um, and so in the late 90s, early 2000s, a few trailblazer female cardiologists said, hey, wait a minute, what are we doing? We need to rework this whole thing. And so the American Heart Association launched this Go Red for Women. Uh, prior to that, I mean, NIH had been um, you know, passing new kind of standards as far as women needed to be included in all of these um, research studies and stuff. Um, the AHA did their Go Red for Women campaign starting in the early 2000s. And so this slide shows that, you know, at this late mid 90s, I guess, um, mark, heart disease for men had started declining. That's the blue line, started really declining in uh, the early 80s. Whereas for women, it was rising up until the point 
that we sort of made these changes and and that's when you see this red line start to fall and approximate the blue line but still not meet it which we're st we're still working on it but so that's i just wanted to give a little bit of an overview of the background of the field and why it's so important um because we have made huge strides obviously but we've got more uh work to go i think female cardiologists represent about 14% of the population of cardiologists now, which is way more than it used to be, but nowhere near the 50% that we would expect um, based on medical school uh, applicants. So going forward, so we wanted to start with this. So this talk is all about testing and risk management and understanding your risk and preventing heart disease as best you can. So Know Your Numbers is this wonderful campaign with the American Heart Association and Go Red for Women um, that is trying to get the message out there that people need to know their numbers. You need to know your cholesterol, you need to know your blood pressure, your fasting blood sugar, and your body mass index, because all four of these things play a huge role in your cardiovascular risk. And your doctor can help you navigate and, uh, and adjust things, lifestyle modifications, medication if necessary, to bring your risk as low as possible. So these are the basics, the easiest ones to obtain, and something that absolutely everyone across the board needs to know. Um, I always like to also say, far as, as far as cholesterol goes, in the past, we used to really go by total cholesterol. But these days, I, I practice by um, and I think it's pretty much the guideline now, you practice by a lipid panel and the breakdown of good versus bad cholesterol, good being the HDL, where we want it to be around 60, uh, bad being the LDL. And that goal is, a, is a, a moving target depending on who the person is. So that would be the first step in uh, knowing your risk and mitigating your risk is know these numbers. Um, the next very basic test that pretty much everyone should have um, at least once a year uh, is an electrocardiogram. You can see it written as an ECG or an EKG. It was originally a German word. That's why you have those two different um, um, ways of, of saying it. So an electrocardiogram is basically, it's what it is, is we put these little um, electrodes on your skin and attach them to these leads that then will read the electricity as it's moving around your heart. And we can then, based on that, determine what is your heart rhythm? What is your heart rate? How is the electricity flowing through your heart? Is it normal or is it meeting some roadblocks and then going in a different direction? Um, we can tell, are there, is there evidence of um, blood flow kind of problems? And most importantly, we can tell, is there an acute heart attack? Um, so that's why, um, that's why EKGs can be quite, uh, quite important uh, electrolyte abnormalities as well. Another thing we can, we can dis discern from an EKG. So here we thought we'd show you, um, just a few, this one is so, so I can kind of walk you guys through, I don't know if it's too much information, but um, all electricity in, in a normal heartbeat starts in the top chamber of the heart. At a, in an area called the sinus node. And that we see um, right here, it creates this little atrial um, contraction. Atria are the top chambers of the heart, ventricles are the bottom. Then it travels to the AV node and then it travels to the ventricle and that's the larger spike. And then we see the heart basically recover and then it does it again. And so that sinus node is your metronome having you beat you know, 60 plus times a minute. Um, here we have an example of an arrhythmia, a common one known as atrial fibrillation. So it's more obvious if you look in this line, you can see how the, the, there's not that organized P wave where, where it was that little beat right before the big uh, beat, um, but we see these just sort of this fibrillation. Um, and what it leads to is you can see how the heart rate is irregular. Some beats come quicker than others. Some beats take a longer time. And, um, and that has a lot of importance because atrial fibrillation increases risk for stroke. So that should be addressed. And a lot of times atrial fibrillation can make your heart go too quickly, which can lead to weakening of the heart muscle. So it's important to 
pick up on these things. And I absolutely have patients who don't feel it and uh, come from their primary who just incidentally did an EKG and found it. So, um, so that's that. Now this is a more dire circumstance. This is what's called an ST elevation MI. So this is an acute heart attack. If you can follow my pointer, you can see these big um, elevations in this segment of the EKG, which is called the um, ST segment. So that to us as a cardiologist indicates an acute uh, situation where the heart muscle is being injured severely and that person needs to go to the cath lab right away. So that's, God forbid that ever happens, that's the people, those are the people who go rushing to the cath lab. Um, so these days, um, Zeopatch, sorry, <laughs> technical problem. Uh, Zeopatch um, is a wonderful new monitoring system that we have. Um, so basically, I think if anybody in the past has worn a monitor for any length of time, like a 30 day or whatever, you would have stickers and wires and a box that you had to attach to your belt and it was uncomfortable and it was annoying and it was cumbersome. Zeopatch is an awesome new system that we have that will monitor your heart for however long you're wearing it. Um, it's You can see it here in the picture. It's just a little sticker. There's no wires. That's all it is. It just sticks right here. Um, and it will monitor your heart, whether it's beating too fast, too slow, there's a button on it. So if you're having a symptom, you push the button. There's also a diary system with an app for your phone if you want to um, you know, record a diary entry, then we'll correlate it to what your heart rhythm was doing at that time. Um, the, these are great. We wear them for seven days or up to 14 days. And you can shower with it on. The only thing they discourage you from doing is um, like excessive exercise and sweating because they don't want the sweat to kind of make it fall off. So, so that is what the Zeo monitor is. Um, and this is, this is basically the, an example of the report that we will get. This is the first page of it. So if a patient has a bad rhythm like a ventricular tachycardia, they'll show us the example of it there. It gives us your overall heart rate range from minimum to maximum with your average overall, and then also your ranges and average when you're in sinus rhythm. And then the most helpful part of it is that it will, anytime you trigger the monitor or record a diary entry, it will provide us with a strip for you know a couple of seconds before and after uh, of what was going on. And we can, I find it so, so helpful because I actually sit down with my patients in the office and I pull up their strips and I say, okay, so it was this date, this time, this is what you felt, this is what the rhythm was. And patients really gain a lot of insight into their own symptoms and what's going on and it's just super helpful. Um, so that's the Zeo patch. Echocardiogram is like a next level up, um, still non-invasive, um, no radiation. It, it uses ultrasound waves to give us so much information about your heart. Um, it, it can tell us about heart size, heart function. We, we describe something called the ejection fraction. Normal is usually 55, 60%, but it's really anywhere from 50 to 75% is normal. Um, so it tells us how well your heart squeezes. It also tells us how well your heart relaxes, which is, is um, equally important. It shows us if you have any damage to your heart muscle. We can see if you've had a heart attack, that part of the muscle might not move as well. It looks at all the valves and it gives us all sorts of information of how well they're opening, how well they're closing, are they leaking? Um, and of course, if there's any kind of a heart defect or congenital heart defect, those are, are very, very helpful. Like I said, no radiation, it takes about 45 minutes. This is one of our wonderful uh, sonographers who um, does wonderful work giving us all this information on our patients. Um, and that is an example of an echo machine. It uses a probe and they put this um, jelly on it to kind of um, help the ultrasound waves penetrate the tissue. Here's an example of an echocardiogram. So when you're using a transducer and you're putting it up against the skin, 
we're, we're essentially looking at an upside down picture of the heart. The Mayo Clinic flips it over, but most other people look at it this way. Um, so the bottom parts down here, these are the atria. They're actually the top chambers of the heart. And um, it's backwards, left and right. So this is the right side of the heart here, and this is the left side. So here you can see this left ventricle. It's tricky to see, but it's squeezing pretty well. Um, you see here this mitral valve is opening really well. The atria is here, the inner atrial septum, the ventricular septum, and this is the RV. Um, so next, here's an example of what we can do with valves. So this is called color flow Doppler. Um, and if you look over here, this is, this is using these ultrasound waves to, it's Doppler, like Doppler radar. So you can tell if things are coming towards you or going away from you. So the blue would be going in that direction and the orange would be going in that. Just to orient everyone, this is the left ventricle, left atrium and aorta. So blood is coming from the left atrium into the left ventricle and then out of the aorta. So we can tell from this if there's any significant leakage on either valve or if they're not opening well enough. So like I said, so much information um, with really no downside, no risk. Now, here's an example of a patient with a cardiomyopathy. So I don't know if you can see, hold on. Sorry, bear with me, okay. That's a normal heart squeezing pretty well. And now if you go back to this one, you can see how it's just sort of not squeezing very well. Um, this patient's ejection fraction is quite low, probably about 15 to 20%. Um, and we can see over here, this bright line, this is a um, ICD, which is something, a defibrillator, an internal cardiac defibrillator that patients who have um, heart failure will often need. Um, and again, mitral valve opening, um, the atria, the ventricles. So that's all the kind of information we can glean from echocardiograms. Next up is stress testing, which is a complicated um, but often common uh, test. So with stress testing, we need a couple of factors. We need to stress the heart, and that can be done either by exercise. We have the Bruce protocol that was developed. So we put you on the treadmill, it goes up it increases in uh, speed and incline every three minutes and patients go as long as they can go. We need your heart rate to hit a certain target to make it a diagnostic test. Um, or for people who can't do the treadmill or sometimes have abnormal EKGs so we can't really monitor them safely, we'll give them the chemical kind of a stress test. And that involves infusing a medication into an IV that will dilate all the blood vessels. And it creates that sort of differential between rest and stress that, that simulates exercise. Um, and it, so it gives us the information we need. So from there, so we can start with just an exercise treadmill stress test where we're monitoring heart rate, blood pressure, and EKG throughout all the stages of the Bruce protocol. Um, when we talk about these tests, we talk about how sensitive they are, like meaning how good are they at picking up actual disease. And then we talk about how specific they are, meaning if they are picking something up, are they accurate in what they're picking up? So the, just the plain treadmill is probably the least sensitive, least specific test that we have. But for someone who's very low risk, it's often a good, a good option. Um, next, we will usually go for, for someone who's still low risk, but but, but more concerning in their story, we'll often go for uh, what's called an exercise stress. Um, oh, sorry, here I wanted to just show you. This is what a, a stress test lo uh, looks like. Here's the treadmill, it's hooked up to a big computer that is um, transmitting your EKG. So we're watching, they're checking blood pressure and everything as, as you walk. Um, and here's a, just another picture of the uh, exercise stress lab in Dover. So the next kind of level up from a, a treadmill stress is to, to add a level of imaging to it. So we'll add echocardiogram. What um, will happen is you'll come to the lab, you lay down on that bed that's featured there and you get an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound 
like we talked about before, it's limited in that it really only looks at different views of how the heart is squeezing and all the different walls of the heart and making sure they're all squeezing, squeezing normally at rest. And then you get on the treadmill and you do your treadmill and then uh, everyone will go, okay, she's done quick. So they stop the treadmill, you got to quick get on the bed and they do the echo again and they just make sure there's no difference. They want to see that that heart is squeezing more vigorously with exercise and there's no wall that's not responding appropriately because then that would be concerning for a blood flow discrepancy between rest and stress. Nuclear stress is the next step up when it comes to you know how sensitive and specific they are. Um, this you can do either the treadmill or if you can't do the treadmill, you can get the, um, the pharmacologic type like I mentioned where you get a medication in your IV. But this also then involves the infusion of a, a low dose radiation uh, from a radioisotope that is actually tagged to your blood cells and then targeted to your heart. So all the blood flowing to your heart will bring this radioisotope to the heart muscle. And then when we have you lay on the camera, it will detect the isotope in your heart. And we see all these different views of it. And what we do is we take resting pictures and we compare them to stress. Um, if there is a major issue in that there's a, um, a blockage, say if this is the resting image and see how this is bright, if there were a blockage, this would be dark purple. And so that's how we can tell, hmm, this is suspicious, we need to investigate further. Um, and this is an example of our nuclear lab at Pease and our fabulous stress tech, Kim. Um, we, we just love working together, Kim's awesome. We, our patients are always so comfortable with Kim and Pam, our stress techs, um, because as you can imagine, stress tests can be stressful. Um, but I think they do a wonderful job at PEAS of putting patients' mind at ease. And uh, they have this wonderful camera that takes just the most beautiful pictures. So we get great information on our patients. So this is an interesting test. Um, this is a coronary artery calcium score. Um, it is a CAT scan that does not involve any kind of IV contrast or dye as you've heard it referred to. This is a, a sort of like a cross section of a heart here you don't see any flecks of white. These are the coronary arteries. And I mean, this is a still for a full calcium score, they scroll through the whole heart. But right here, you don't see any flecks of whites. So that's a calcium score of zero. Um, here you see a little, the number goes up. Here you see a little more and it's even higher. And here you see just a ton. See all this white is calcium in the coronary arteries. Um, and this has been researched extensively. Um, uh, and they've, dis they've distinguished a score called the Agatson score, which will reflect um, how much calcium is present in the arteries. And the research has showed that a score of zero means there's none and you have a very low risk of developing heart problems in the future. Um, when there is calcium, the higher the score, obviously the higher your risk of heart disease. In general, a score from 100 to 400 is moderate risk. And so this, you know, you can address your risk factors uh, appropriately, but anyone who has a, a score of 400 or higher is considered to be high risk um, and their doctor needs to kind of address that with them. Um, so the, the benefit of coronary artery calcium scoring is really helps us in risk stratifying people. Um, so if you're, an otherwise very healthy person, um, that you have a strong family history and you're concerned, or if, you're, um, if your cholesterol number is sort of falling in this like intermediate risk um, range, coronary, you know, I, I, of course people are reluctant to start statins and I, I am very appreciative of that. Um, but, you know, this test can kind of help us to say, okay, so you're in the intermediate risk with your cholesterol and then, oh, and you have a zero calcium score. Okay, we can feel better about holding off on statin for now, or you're in the 400 range, we really need to address this cholesterol, you know? So that's where that test really becomes helpful. 
Coronary CT angiography is also a newer test, a wonderful test. It's a CAT scan as well. This one does involve a little bit of IV contrast. Um, it's low dose radiation uh, and it will produce these beautiful pictures. So here you can see the coronary arteries uh, coming off of the aorta. And in various kind of views and images, this test will show us not only calcified plaque, but also soft plaque. And it will show us soft plaque within the wall of the artery, even if it's not really significantly narrowing the artery. So with this test, we can see if there's atherosclerosis going on, um, even if um, it's not significant to any degree. And that can help us again with risk stratification and modifying lifestyle and that sort of thing. Um, so then we get to cardiac catheterization, which is the most um, invasive of all the testing. So, you know, as a cardiologist, we always weigh risk and benefit. And um, when, we're, when we're needing to diagnose coronary artery disease definitively though, cardiac catheterization is the gold standard. Um, it basically, so it used to involve uh, accessing the femoral artery in the groin, which was technically difficult because really more in recovery because it's a large artery and you really have to compress it when you're done to make sure they don't bleed. We've gotten much better these days about using the right radial artery, which is right here in your wrist. Um, and people will come out of the cath lab just wearing a bracelet with a balloon that's been pumped up and they slowly release the pressure on that artery um, and they do fine. But basically they will access that artery and they will, um, thread through the, they, they act through their access, they thread this tiny, thin, long catheter that goes up to the aorta, that where the aorta comes off the heart, that's where the coronary arteries come off of the aorta and supply blood to the heart muscle. And then they'll use a small amount of that contrast material and inject that down each of the coronary arteries. And you'll get almost like a roadmap of the coronaries. And you can tell if there's a narrowing, you know, whether it's mild or severe or completely blocked. Um, so get, it gets, again, like I said, that's the gold standard because if there is a blockage that is amenable, they can at that time fix it with a stent potentially. So this is just to orient everybody. This is the left main and then the left um, anterior descending. Everybody mostly, there are people who have different anatomies, but the majority of us have a left main, a left anterior descending artery comes right down the front of the heart like that. That's the one you've heard of called as the widow maker. This is the left circumflex that actually goes kind of around the back of the heart to the left. And then this is the right corner that kind of goes around the heart to the right and then usually down the back. Um, and so this is what the cath will show us. So we have some examples of caths here. This is, um, so when they inject the dye, they use fluoroscopy, which is x-ray to take pictures and they can move it around and take different kind of pictures. So if you can see here, see the abrupt, there's an abrupt cutoff of this vessel right here. And then over here, if you wait, when it's not injected, you can see metal, that, that's a stent. And then it's a little difficult to see because the angle is slightly different, but this is the LAD that they then opened up and is now getting flow all the way down the front of the heart where it was not, yeah, but where it was not before. Um, here's another one. This is an example of the right coronary artery. And so you can see here how it's abruptly cut off and there's no flow really distal to that. And then look over here, they've stented it. And now look at how much artery, look at how much how many blood vessels are then getting blood that weren't getting before and that, that territory of heart muscle was suffering for that. Um, this is a similar one. Uh, this one was the interesting one. Oh no, no it wasn't. So this, um, this is an example of, uh, again, you can see how this is just a still, but you can see how the right coronary artery just stops. And then once they've stented it, look at all this, muscle that was not getting blood flow before that now is. So that's wonderful. This is a picture of the cath lab at Wentworth Douglas. They're beautiful screen, beautiful setup. It's always sterile and um, 
uh, you know, every precaution is taken. It is a low risk procedure overall. It's a less than 1% chance of a complication, um, but still we always outweigh risk and benefit and we always do our best to mitigate any risk um, by checking every box, you know. Cardiac MRI is another wonderful modality of testing that gets us a, a ton of information about the heart. It's magnetic resonance imaging. Um, so it uses a powerful magnetic field and it will identify structures within and around the heart. It will identify if you've had a heart attack, if you're at risk for a heart attack, it can quantify valvular issues um, pretty accurately. Um, and any kind of structural um, heart disease, really, uh, this can be very helpful in. It is, you know, an MRI, so it is this tube that is enclosed, and it does take about 45 minutes, so it can be a little tricky for people. Um, but like I said, amazing amount of information. Here's an example of a cardiac MRI and all the different views. So this was as if you cut a heart from, this was the top, and this was the bottom, and you kind of sliced it this way. Uh, another view, all the different views. And I don't know if you can notice, this is the, 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 you can see a little bit of mitral regurgitation here. You see this cloud go back with every beat? So that can help you to understand and identify valvular problems. So um, I've talked a lot about a lot of, uh, um, intricate tests and, and um, you know, giving you guys a lot of information. The bottom line is though, I think, you know, for a, a normal healthy individual, recommended screenings are really those, knowing those numbers, like I mentioned in the beginning. So knowing your blood pressure, um, you know, it should be checked every time you visit a healthcare provider. Um, knowing your cholesterol, if your normal risk, it's like, you know, every four to six years, if you have more elevated risk, it's probably gonna be every year. Um, but uh, like I said, um, getting that full lipid panel with the HDL, LDL is important. Knowing your weight is always important and calculating your body mass index. In addition to that, knowing your waist circumference because um, they've shown that trunkal obesity actually increases your risk of heart disease more than other forms of obesity. Um, if you're a normal, healthy individual, check your blood sugar at least every three years um, and always address, you know, lifestyle things like smoking, um, physical activity level, diet, healthy diet. Um, bottom line is no smoking ever, not even a puff. Um, so this is just our kind of sum it up slide um, with a, our message that taking care of your health is important for everyone, regardless of age or gender. Still, there are unique challenges that must be addressed with age, and there are even more specific concerns facing women. Not only must a woman consider additional factors such as reproductive health, cardiovascular health is another matter of particular importance. And this is especially true as women age.